Fantastic. So welcome. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elaine Midgley and I'm Director of Bedford Creative Arts. And this is one of our Producer Hub webinars. So there'll be a number of people on the call who are part of our Producer Hub cohort today. I'm going to be talking about budgeting and fundraising. And I warn you now, it is a really dry subject. I did think about trying to jazz up the slides and making it a little bit more interesting, but I think it is what it is. So apologies if it's just a little bit dry um, and there will be spreadsheets involved inevitably. Um, I'm trying to pitch this at a level where if you don't have experience of budgeting and fundraising, hopefully it'll be useful to you. So if you are more experienced, you might find this a little bit basic. So I apologize in advance if I'm teaching grandmother how to suck eggs with some of this stuff. But hopefully some of it will be a useful recap, if nothing else. And I think if you're about to prepare a budget for a project and thinking about sources of income, Hopefully this is going to have some use for you now. Um, and as I say, you're going to get the slides and everything available at the end online so you can go back to them if you want to. So let's get started. So a little bit about context of the webinars. If you don't know, Bedford Creative Arts is an arts charity that's been around in Bedford for 38 years, 39 years this year. Um, and we do a socially engaged practice across multiple art forms. This particular programme we're delivering in partnership with a producing organisation called One Degree East. And it's about supporting people who live in Bedfordshire to put their own arts projects on, whether they be producers or self-producing artists or anyone with an idea for creative projects. So the idea is we're building up a suite of tools that can be used by people to build their own projects. So some of the webinars in this series are being delivered by BCA, and some of them are being delivered by associates of One Degree East. So today, I'm going to look a bit about the terminology around budgeting, particularly when you're writing funding applications, you might find that people use terminology which you may or may not be familiar with. So we'll look at some of those things. And then we we'll go through the basics of how to build a budget. And I'll give you a particular example. It's just a BCA way of doing things. It's not necessarily what you have to do or the best way of doing things but hopefully it's an example that will be useful. We'll talk a bit about managing financial risk, which sounds boring, but what's one of the things that a lot of funders ask about now is how are you going to manage risk in your project? And financial risk is a big part of that. So hopefully I'll give you some advice about how to answer those questions. And then we'll look at some fundraising tips. This is not going to be a crash course in fundraising, but just a few tips about different forms of fundraising and then a bit of time at the end for questions. So terminology, again, some of you may be very familiar with this, some of you not so much. And one of the key differences, I think, when you're looking at budgeting is, are you doing it as an individual freelancer or as an organisation? And a lot of funders, when they ask you about budgets, come from the approach that they assume that you're an organisation. So they may use organisation terminology, which you might not be familiar with as a freelancer and may not be relevant. So if I take a term like profit and loss, that is basically some a business's income and expenditure sheet. Now, as a freelancer, you might not work in that kind of way. Um, but what it means is they want to see something that shows the money coming in and the money coming out and the difference at the bottom. Now, a lot of businesses, when they do management accounting, which is producing a set of accounts, probably on a monthly basis, definitely on a quarterly basis, and then on an annual basis, is they will have a sheet that shows this is what came in, this is what came out, and we've either got a profit at the bottom or a loss, depending on how you look at it. So some people talk about the P&L, profit and loss, some people might talk about the I&E, income and expenditure, it's the same thing, regardless of which bit of terminology you use. Again, if you're a freelancer, you probably won't do that, but you might want to do it in the context of a project. It's not entirely dissimilar to a budget, but that's what that terminology means. So if someone says they want to see your income and expenditure management accounts or your profit and loss, what they want to see is over a period of time, what came in, what came out, what was the difference? A balance sheet. Again, this is to do with organisational terminology. That's a statement of a company's assets. So as an individual, you probably don't produce balance sheets, but if you were constituted in any way, or if you're partnering with an organisation that is and a funder asks for a balance sheet, then what they want is to know what assets the company has. Now that's cash and non-cash that has a financial value. So a balance sheet is just a moment in time look at what the company owns, whether it's got cash in the bank, whether it's owed cash from people. So it's almost like it has that cash because it's owed it, whether it's got debts, 
and whether it's got stuff that's worth money, whether that's equipment or properties and things like that. Again, if you're a freelancer, you're not likely to have a balance sheet, but if you're working with an organisation, they can do it. Now, you can produce a balance sheet at any moment in time. I could produce a balance sheet for Bedford Creative Arts today, and it would show what assets, cash and stuff worth money, the business has today. It's only valid for that moment in time. It's usually only really produced by businesses quarterly and at the end of the year. But if you download a company's annual accounts, you'll see a balance sheet as well as a profit and loss for the year. In kind. This is one of those terms that's really important to get used to. People have different phrases for it. They might say pro bono or in kind is probably more commonly used these days. And that's just where someone has given you something that has a financial value, but they've not asked for the cash for it. So I could give my time in kind. Now that has value because I'm paid. And so you would normally pay for my time, but I could choose to donate it and it would be in kind. When you're producing a budget, you need to think about the value of everything that's in kind, income and expenditure. And what you'll do is you'll show it coming in and coming out. And that's really important because it can be used to show as match funding for almost every funder will consider in kind to be match funding. So if someone donates equipment, how much would it have cost to have hired that equipment? That's the value in kind. If someone's donating their time, how much would you have to pay them if you paid them? That's the value in kind. Profit versus surplus. This is something which is interesting. Charities are not allowed to make a profit. The word profit in business terminology tends to be money that you would pay to your shareholders. So if you were a corporation and you make a profit, that's money where you have money come in, money come out, and you've made some money at the bottom, but it's something that you have discretion to do with, such as pay to your shareholders. Now, most not-for-profit businesses are charities, and they're not allowed to have shareholders, and they're not allowed to pay shareholders. So they can't technically make a profit. What they make is a surplus. And the reason why the difference in terminology is different is just because profit can signal to somebody, oh, money that you're keeping for yourself or paying to your big wigs. Where a surplus just says, oh, look, we had a bit left over. And what you do is you reinvest it back into the charity. So BCA often makes a surplus because it allows us to reinvest in forthcoming years of activity or to invest in things that we might need. Like if we need to replace the company laptops, we need to make a surplus to be able to afford to do that. But we never make a profit. But technically, it's the same. Deficit. It's literally just another word for loss. So basically, if you had some money come in and more came out than you had come in, you made a loss. May or may not be a problem, depending on if you've got cash in the bank to deal with that loss, whether you're expecting to make a loss. But that's what we mean by deficit. Match funding. This is a term that funders use, which is often where they're expecting to be the main funder. So if you're going to Arts Council as your main funder, but they don't necessarily want to fund 100% of the project. They don't want to be the only funder. So match funding is just something which is saying, if you're getting some money from somewhere, what other money is coming in as well, which is going to match that? Some funders will have a percentage that they expect. So Arts Council these days ask you to aim for at least 10% match funding for a project grant. But you don't have to. They're sympathetic to the fact that sometimes that's not possible. And if you can have more, they're probably going to love it because it's going to look like more horses are being backed in the race. Yeah. So match funding is important. And again, in kind can count as match funding as well as cash from other people or other sources, which could be earned income. Now, these are some more terminology on the other side, which is more to do with businesses and organisations. But especially if you're partnering with an organisation or you see it on your funding applications and you think, ah, I don't know how to answer this. It's important. Reserves. Reserves is cash that the company holds. There's lots of different types of reserves and there's good reasons and bad reasons for having reserves. So types of reserves. Unrestricted. Unrestricted literally means it has no specific purpose. So it's just money that you've built up over time and the company has complete discretion over what it spends it on. You can choose, you can keep it, you can spend it, you can spend it, whatever you like. It's not restricted. There are no restrictions on what you do with that funding. The opposite of that, of course, is restricted. And that's where you've been given money for a specific purpose. So if the Arts Council gives you a grant for a project, it can only be used for that project. 
unless they give permission otherwise. So it should be restricted for that project. Then you have designated. Now designated is the same as unrestricted. They are unrestricted funds, but the difference is the company has put them to one side for a purpose. It's a little bit like restricting funding, but less legally restricted. Funds that are restricted are legally restricted. It is illegal to spend them on something else unless you have the person who gave them to use permission to spend them on something else. You can only spend them on that thing. Designated is where the company has said, oh, I had these unrestricted funds and I decided I'm going to put some over there because I'm, you know, saving up to buy a really big piece of equipment. So I'm going to create a designated fund. I put some of my unrestricted reserves to that point so I can build it up and spend it on that thing. But I can change my mind because they're technically unrestricted. So if I decide I don't want to buy that thing after all, I can put it over there. Or if the company's in crisis, like during COVID, and they think, oh no, I need cash and I need it fast, I can undesignate it at any time. But it's quite helpful for funders who go, why have you got £50,000 in reserve? Why are you asking me for a grant for £20,000 when you've got 50000 in the bank? You could say, oh, I know I've got 50000 in the bank, but it's designated for this really big project I'm going to do in three years' time I'm saving up for. So I'd like not to spend it, please. That's fine. But often what funders will look for is how much have you got in reserves and why is it there? So it's important that you say, oh, some of that's restricted. I'm not allowed to spend it on this project. Some of it's unrestricted, but it might be designated. And that helps to justify why you've got money in reserve. If you've got anything that's unrestricted and not designated, it's free reserves. So they might say, how much you've got in free reserves? And that's just money sitting there that you could spend. Your annual accounts are what a company produces once a year that shows a moment in time at the end of that financial year and it will contain their profit and loss, their income and expenditure for the year, showing whether or not there is a profit or loss or surplus if they're a charity at the bottom. It'll also show what they've got in reserve and whether they're unrestricted or restricted and if they're unrestricted, are they free or are they designated? And that's what your annual accounts will show. And you'll also have your balance sheet in there. The reason why it's quite helpful to know this is I always recommend looking up your funders in Companies House or the Charity Commission and looking at their annual accounts, because then you can see how rich the funder is and how much money they're likely to give you. So it's quite useful for fundraising. How to pay artists. So you've got to pay people. And I will absolutely champion for this. One thing people do is they say, this fund is only going to give me £20,000, so I will make the project fit the funding available and I won't pay myself. The danger with you doing that is you help to perpetuate the industry's problem of people not getting paid. If you don't pay yourself properly, the funders will think these things don't cost money and they'll perpetuate the idea of not giving enough money. The more of us who say, I'm sorry, but that's what it really costs to do it and everybody's being paid, the better. Arts Council are big champions of this. But contrary to popular belief, there is no Arts Council rate of pay. Some people have said, oh, the Arts Council pay lots of money. We recommend you pay lots of money. No, they don't. The Arts Council have no recommended rate of pay. What they say is we expect you to use a system for deciding how much you pay artists, but they don't specify what that is. So when they ask you about paying artists, they will say, what code of practice are you using? And on the right side, you've got some examples of trade union agreements or industry bodies that have recommendations about pay. And they spend a lot of time researching the sector, benchmarking, looking at what other people are paying, and they suggest recommended rates of pay. If you are unionised, like something like equity or musicians union, then you would expect absolutely no less than the trade union recommended rate of pay. So depending on what part of the industry you're in, so we talk about the arts, but actually you've got musicians, you've got visual artists, you've got theatre practitioners, they're all slightly different, then you need to think about what's most relevant to you. And if you're doing a multiple project with different types of artists, you've got musicians and visual artists working together, you might need to ask yourself, are you going to just stick with their rates of pay or are you going to try and do something in between? The Arts Council aren't going to tell you what's right and wrong. They just want you to prove that there is method in what you're doing that you can say this is why I'm paying what I'm paying but they will be very very 
dim viewed about anyone not paying people properly, paying under a recognised rate of pay or not paying people at all. What you could do is you could choose to donate your time. So what I would say is if you really think you're so passionate about doing a project and you can't afford to do it unless you don't pay yourself partly and you really think you have to do it, and I still take a different view, then what I would say is put it in kind. Show the value that you're not paying yourself and then say, I'm donating some of my time. And I think that's really important to you as a freelancer. So one of the things I would say is that as a freelancer, you should be setting your own rate of pay. You should not be accepting what an organisation wants to pay you. You should be saying, this is my rate and setting it and maybe setting it against one of those things. If you had a plumber come to your house and you said, how much to replace my boiler? You wouldn't say, well, what's your budget? And then you do it. He'd say, I'm going to charge this much. And you go, fine. And you either accept the quote or you don't. It's exactly the same with all freelancers. Now, what you could do is if someone turns around and says, oh, you want £300 a day? Well, I normally only pay 250 and I've only budgeted for 250 You could say, if you wanted to be generous, I will do it for 250 But I would thoroughly recommend that you send an invoice that says, my daily rate is £300 a day times so many days, minus discount for mates rates because I'm being nice, and then that's the value you owe me. So that you always demonstrate that you have a rate of pay, and then it's up to you whether you negotiate or not. But the difference between a freelancer and an employee is that a freelancer sets their rate of pay, whereas an employee gets told what they're paid by their employer. And this is important if you've ever heard of IR in the Review 35. This came into effect to stop employers from using freelancers because they couldn't be bothered to employ people. And what happens when they couldn't be bothered to employ people is that people end up working freelance and they don't get sick pay when they're entitled to it. They don't get pensions when they're entitled to it. They don't get paid holiday when they're entitled to it. So to stop businesses from exploiting people, they made it very clear what the difference was between a freelancer and employee. And the difference is basically... You're an employee if your employer sets how many hours you work and what you get paid. So if I say I want you in Monday to Friday, nine to five, and I'm going to pay you £28,000 a year for it, you're an employee. If I say I'd like you to do this job, please, how much would you charge and how many days would it take? You're a freelancer. So how long it takes you and what you're paid should be in your control. Now, when you're budgeting to use artists, it's really hard if you don't know what their different rates of pay is. So you're probably going to have to guess. You're going to have to say, well, I'm I'm going to use a visual artist. I don't actually know which artist I'm using yet because I'm going to do an open call. So I don't know what their rate of pay is going to be. So I'm going to budget assuming that they've got about this level of experience, they're this sort of period, and I'm going to use an Artist Union England rate of this. So you need to make those decisions. And of course, you might not get them right if you're at the budgeting stage, because you might find that artist actually has a higher rate of pay or a lower rate of pay if they're less experienced. But hopefully that's quite clear. If you're going to be employing people, be really aware of what the national mi- minimum wage or living wage is for the person of that age group. Because again, make sure you don't come in a bit too low. Hopefully that explains a little bit about this, but please, please pay yourself against a, a really good rate. Income types. So here's a suggestion of all the different types of income that you might want to put into your budget. Um, earned income. What does that mean? That means any money that you're paid as, as fees, so any money that you earn by selling something. Now, that could be selling tickets. It could be selling adverts. It could be selling sponsorship, actually. It could be selling your time as consultancy. But it's money that you earn in any one of those categories. Some funders will say how much is earned income and they might expect you to include lots of things like ticketing and advertising and all that stuff in in one category. Then there's lots of other statutory and public funding out there. So they might sometimes ask you to specify how much is coming from a local authority. That might be paid like a fee, it might be paid as a contract, it might be paid as a grant. The Arts Council is a statutory body, it's an arm's length government owned body. So that's government funding or it might be lottery funding. Trust and foundations. There are lots of charities out there that give grants and donations. We usually refer to them as trusts and foundations because they're either set up as a charitable trust or a charitable foundation. I won't go into the differences. There's not much in it. Investment income. So that is effectively interest from you know money you've got in the bank. But again, if you're an organisation, you might have investments that might be producing income and you can include that as much. 
other lottery grants. So lottery funding is given in lots of different ways. Other lottery funders include the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the National Lottery Community Fund, Sports England, it's all lottery money. The money that the Arts Council put into project grants is lottery money. The money that they put into MPOs is usually straight from central government. And the money that we get as BCO is straight from central government. It's not from the lottery. One of the differences is the logo. If you see the Arts Council logo where you see the Arts Council logo in like a circle, that means MPO, that means central government money. If you see the logo that's like that, that's the fingers, that's lottery. Quite often I see people using the wrong logo or things. If you've got a project grant, that's the logo you want. Individual giving, so that's money from people who have made donations or have signed up to membership schemes and things like that. Individual giving, high net worth individuals, lots of things like that. And then you've got money from businesses. Now businesses can donate in a couple of ways. They can give you a donation, which isn't a lot different to be honest from getting an individual donation, or they can sponsor. The difference is a sponsorship is a business transaction. They're getting something from you in return from giving you money. If they give a donation, they expect nothing in return. Corporate sponsorship is a VATable supply. If we were VAT registered, I would charge VAT on sponsorship because it's a trade. I wouldn't on a donation, it's a gift. And again, the expectations of what a business would want in return are different depending on if it's sponsorship or donation. So it's worth clarifying that point. Expenditure types. Here's a whole load of different types of expenditure. It's worth when you're doing a budget, trawling through a list like this, which is effectively a list of account codes. That's another bit of financial terminology. Sometimes they might talk about account codes. If you've ever used accountancy software like Xero or Sage or something like that, you might find that you see that they have account codes. And what that means is the type of expense. If you're a business, it's really helpful to catalog your expenditure according to account codes. So if you want to say, how much did I spend on artist fees this year? Across all of my projects, you can see, because it will be logged as a particular account code. A lot of funders will have their own account codes when they ask you to put your budget on the form. And they will say, how much are you spending on event costs? How much are you spending on, you know, staffing? That's an account code. But what you find is the code that you use yourself might be slightly different from a funder. But it's certainly worth thinking about all these different types. When you're building a budget, you need to think in as much detail as possible. And so it's worth thinking about all of these things. Some of them might not be relevant, especially if you're not using venues and buildings, and some of them will be. But yeah, go through all those different account cases and think what types of expense might I have in that category. So we'll go now onto an example budget. And again, what I'm going to show you is literally what we use a BCA. Hopefully that's not too small for you. And again, as I say, I will make sure you get a copy of this spreadsheet. Some people really don't like the psychedelic colours, so I apologise if you're a bit low. Whoa, with the colours, don't worry too much about those. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about why we lay these things out in this particular way. And as I say, it's not necessarily best practice, it's just a particular example. So have your income at the top. You're going to want to track your project as you go when you've got a budget. You're going to want to log your expenses and your income as it happens, and you may want to know the date. It's particularly relevant if you've got a project which crosses different financial years, and that's relevant to you. Um, we normally then just say, who is this money from or going to, and give yourself some space so you can write a description. And then there's that term again, account code. That's just how I'm going to catalogue it. If it's expenditure, is it artist fees, is it materials, is it marketing? Those sorts of things are quite helpful if you want to start comparing them over time. But you can have account codes for income as well. Is it a grant? Is it a fee? Is it advertising? Is it sponsorship? Different account codes. Again, if you're an individual freelancer, you may not need to use any of this terminology. If you're working with a funder that has account codes, use the account codes that they put on their form. So if the Arts Council wanted you to catalogue access costs or something, use that account code. And then it'd be really helpful when you're reporting back to them to look at your spreadsheet and work out which figures go in which boxes. And then we have three columns at BCA when we track budgets. We have our budget, our committed and our actuals. And the reason why I do those three is because they're different at different times. So a budget is a plan, a plan for what you're going to get in and a plan for what you're going to spend it does not mean that's what's going to happen, but it is certainly what you're going to tell your funders that your plan is. Well, I'm planning 
to get this money in and planning to spend that. So we always do that when we design a project, we fill in that budget column. And it's so important that at the bottom, you make sure it's always zero. You're not gonna look to make a surplus on a project. You're just not, because the fund is gonna go, why have you made a profit on my money? It's restricted, remember? What you might do though is pay yourself something and that might create an organizational surplus, but on your project, always make sure that you kind of break even at the bottom or you plan to break even. But what you're gonna do is once you get started, once you've raised the money and you're ready to start, is you're gonna start committing that spend. So an example of committing it might be, you're gonna contract an artist. I'm gonna, I'm gonna contract my lead artist now, I'm gonna do a contract. And in that contract, I'm gonna to pledge to pay them this much straight up front, this much halfway through and this much at the end. So what I can then do is I can actually start to put that detail in here and say, I've now committed a thousand pounds at the start. I've committed a thousand pounds to come out in three months time and committed a thousand pounds to come out in six months time. Now that means it's gonna happen now. It's actually gonna happen. Again, you can also log your committed income. So as soon as someone actually gives you some money, you go, great, that's committed now. And then you can start to see a difference between what you plan to spend and what is actually likely to happen. It still hasn't happened yet though, it's just a commitment. Then we have the actual column and we use the actual column to put in what has actually happened now, what has actually come in. It's not a pledge, it's not a funder telling me they're going to give me a grant of 10,000 pounds, they've given me the 10,000 pounds and I've got it in my bank account. And actual expenditure is, I have actually paid this now. Normally what we do is at the point at which something becomes an actual, we match the committed column because you are definitely committed to something that has actually happened. So eventually you'll find the committed column and the actual column begin to match up, but it may remain different from your budget. And sometimes it's helpful to keep your budget different because if you wanna go back at the end and tell your funder, oh, I know I plan to spend that, but I actually spent it on something different. That's gonna help you see the difference. And the reason why I put this column here at the end in I, which is variance on your budget versus what have you committed, is that as you start to commit things, you think the difference. Or what you could do is you could do a variance on your committed versus your actual, which is actually, what have I committed to spend and what have I actually got left? But either way, it allows you to just try the difference. What I'll do now is I'll show you one that's filled in. This is completely made up, completely made up, but it just gives you a bit of a sense. I've not put in the dates because obviously it's totally fictional. But let's imagine in this scenario, you're getting a project grant in of just over 10,000 pounds, so you've budgeted for it to happen. You've also made a grant application to the Gale Family Trust, local trust funder. They only go over give up to 3,000 pounds. It's always worth asking for twice that. They only fund you once a year and they only fund charities. So if you're gonna get the money from them, you need to partner with the charity. But you know, let's imagine in this case, they've given us 3,000 pounds and they've told us already that we've got it. So we've not just budgeted for it, but Committed now, great. We haven't received it. We haven't had the check-in yet, but it's on its way. Ticket sales, this is a guess. You're always gonna to want to put as much detail as possible in the description. Every funder and especially the Arts Council wants to work out how you have calculated the figure you've used. So you have to demonstrate it. You have to say, why have you come up with that figure? Why is it 1500 pounds? You have to put a bit of logic in. So it's worth putting that down. So let's say, Whatever this project is, we're going to sell tickets for. We've assumed that there's a hundred seats in the house, and we every showing we do, we're going to sell seventy five percent of them at fifteen pounds per ticket. So that's how we've worked out fifteen hundred pounds. It's not committed yet because until we sell the tickets, it's not going to happen. Advertising again. Let's say we're we've got a program for this project. Looks like it's in a theatre or something, and. You know, let's say we've got spaces for 10 half page advertisements and we're going to sell them at 50 pounds. And let's say we sell all of them. We sell out the program. That's going to give me 500 quid in. Now, in this scenario, I've put in kind in, in with everything else. Some funders, including the Arts Council, put the in kind in separately. I think it's quite helpful to see it in the whole. It's entirely up to you. You can put it separate or you can have it, but definitely don't forget it. The reason why it's quite helpful to see it in amongst everything is because it's match. So let's say in this case, in this case, there's going to be a venue hire and the venue's giving us the venue for free. Well, it's not, it's not free. It would have cost money if I had to pay for it, but it's in kind. So the account code is in kind, £2,000, and that's committed. They've pledged that they're definitely going to do that. Definitely got £2,000 coming in. 
And the other thing is this is a BCA project and we're an MPO and we have some money for the MPO and usually that goes on staffing, but I've decided that £2,500 of the staff are going to be free in this project. So I've put in 2500 there. And again, that's committed because we've got our MPO guaranteed. Now, what that means is for this project that hasn't started yet, I haven't raised my Arts Council money yet. There's a lot of risk in there because I've got ticketing and advertising I haven't sold yet. But because of the in-kind and because I've got that one grant, that means £7,500. I might not have it yet, tangibly, but it's committed, so it counts as match. And actually, if you work out the percentage, 38%. Now, if the Arts Council only want 10, we nearly got 40% match. That's that's a strong application. And again, could be cash, could be in kind. You could take the 3,000 from Gale out, you'd still have more than 10% match. And then what you've got is the same with expenditure. So you start going through line by line, individual by individual. Now we find it's helpful to separate out these yellow bits we separate out because we like to think in terms of bits of a project so you might focus on creative activities separate from marketing separate from evaluation separate from project management and um, and actually you might delegate that if you're a big team you might say i'm going to ask my marketing person to look after the marketing budget so they know which section is relevant to them so that's what our little yellow bits show but what you've got there is the name of the supplier and then you've got, again, a calculation for how we've worked it out. Now, in this scenario, we've assumed um, a particular artist rate. And so for an artist with that level of experience, if you look at that particular union rate, they say for design and preparation work, you should charge £202.12 a day. So that's why we've put in that rate. And we've assumed that the preparation time is going to be about three days. Now, it might be that, again, when we tender it, the artist is going to set their own rate. It might be different, but... I've got to build a budget somehow, and that's how I've done it. And so then you've got that figure there, which is literally, you can see actually there's a formula up there in the corner, that rate times by three. And then you work your way through. Now for a workshop delivery, the rate goes up slightly, you know, nearly two, 256 pounds. Again, let's say three days, exhibition installation. You work it out, but make sure you've got logic as to what you're working out and show it to the funder. Again, artist expenses, we worked out the value of a train ticket to London, how many days they're going to be coming up. We've given it a travel account code. There's a rate there. You might get some quotes in. That's another way of doing it is you might say that actually I'm, I haven't calculated it as a rate, but what I've done is I've approached someone and I've asked them to give me a quote for how much it would cost and then I've just slotted the quote right, right in. So that time I haven't given an explanation for how the set construction is come together because I just asked for a quote and they gave it to me and it was that much. Refreshments for meetings, venue hire. Now, again, this is interesting. This is in kind. So what you do with in kind is if you put it in the top, you have to put exactly the same as the bottom. So it comes in and it comes out, but in the same way that it was a, would have been a real expense, you can see that it was income. So that's not cash changing hands, but you can see the value and it helps to make sure that you see the total value of the project. So, you know, that's all the way through, really. So that's just an example for you. As I say, we'll send it out. And then the important thing is that the income and expenditure matches and there's surplus versus deficit there. The one thing you're going to notice in terms of in-kind that doesn't match here is going to be the amount that goes to BCA. Now, I said we were going to put an MPO contribution in £2,500 towards staffing and overheads. But what I've put down here is... 5,550. That's because BCA would like to get some money. So the committed bit is that two and a half thousand pounds has already come off, which is the in-kind. But I would like some contribution for this project towards BCA. So that's the only thing that's different, and that's why. And that is literally how BCA does things. We have to get contributions for our projects because the Arts Council money does not fund all of our staffing and overheads about, yeah, well, in some years, 35% of the um, Arts Council's money covers our turnover but we have to get the rest in so you might want to do something similar and you could do that as a freelancer you could say i am going to donate some of my time which i'm going to put in in kind but i would like to be paid for the rest that's just an illustration for how you might want to account for that but what's really important you want to allow but a good level of match if you can so hopefully that has explained a possible way of doing budgeting
financial risk i know it's so boring i'm so sorry but i guarantee you you're going to get asked about it and you definitely are on the project grant form they will ask you about risks to your project now that is not the same as health and safety risk assessments this is strategic risk what might stop the project from happening or make it happen badly and examples could, could include financial risk but also reputational risk that's something that Arts Council has been in the news about very recently, those of you might have noticed. But, it, you know, everyone needs to think about these kind of strategic risks. What could derail your project and how are you going to deal with it? One of your risks is always going to be financial risk because money is always something that could go wrong. And what I would recommend you do is just do a very quick crude risk assessment to help think about this. So that means what is the risk? What is the financial risks or risks? What would cause them? How likely are they to happen? They're not very likely. They may or may not be that fast. How severe would it be if it did happen? And mitigation, meaning what can you do to either prevent it happening entirely or minimise the damage if it does? Minimise the damage or the likelihood. And there's just a few suggestions. So one of them is if you put things in your budget like, I'm going to get this much money from ticket sales. Well, what happens if you just don't? What happens if some of it doesn't sell out? What happens if you only sell half the advertising? How are you going to deal with that? So you need to have an answer for that question. It could be that you say, well, I've built in a contingency, so it's not a problem. Or it could be that you say, do you know what? There's some stuff I can cut. So I'm going to wait until I know how much I've sold, and then I'm going to make a decision about how fancy the set is. And if I have to make it a bit simpler, I've got time to do that at that point. Just make sure you've thought about an answer to the question or ways in which you can guarantee. It could be that you say, well, I'm going to wait until I sell the tickets before I even start the project. So if I haven't sold them, I'll know before I stop. You know, as long as you've got an answer, that's fine. System or contractual failures. So what happens if the artist walks off the project? What is going to be in your contract that is going to cause you financial risk? Are you going to still owe them some money even if they haven't done the work? Are you going to have to pay more to another artist to pick up the project? Or it could be a system failure. It could be that... I literally misentered stuff into the spreadsheet. My formulas didn't add up and I made a mistake and I've actually spent more than I realised. Oh no, it's all gone wrong. How are you going to deal with that and prevent it? Fraud and theft. So for example, in my organisation, it's impossible for any member of staff to take money out of the account. You need two signatures and that's just to prevent fraud. Two people would have to be in cahoots in order to actually defraud BCA. Um, but it still happens, you know, people try and you know, steal money and things could go wrong. So again, think about particularly if you're handling cash, petty cash, how are you doing that to keep it safe? How are you preventing that from happening? Who's got control over the budget? Overspending, just this is a simple thing of just what happens if you just, you know, you have a bad day on the workshop delivery and someone goes, oh no, I need a new cable for this. So I'll just run out to the shop and just buy one now. And, you know, you just do it, don't you? You just solve the problem in the spur of the moment. Just go, I'll worry about the money later. That kind of poor cost control can cause you problems. So again, how are you going to do it? And one of the things you do is by making sure you've got provision left, right and centre for those little bits and pieces that could go wrong. Inflation. What happens if by the time you've actually started doing the project, inflation has happened so badly that what you budgeted for isn't valid anymore or just costs go up? You know, you just haven't noticed something that you needed. So just, just think about these things when you're doing budgets. I would do it at the point that you build the budget. It's just brainstorm some of these things and just say, what is the answer? But when you get to the question on the Arts Country Project Grant form or any funders form, then you've got an answer. So budgeting approach, just, just a few thoughts when you're doing it then, and then we'll, we'll start concluding on the budgeting bit. So err on the side of caution. Better include stuff you don't need and then have a bit of money left over that you have to reinvest in the project um, than the other way around. Um, Remember that you will have to give restricted funds back if you haven't spent it on the project, or you can get their permission to spend elsewhere. So some funders, if you turn around and go, do you know what? I'm actually likely to have some money left over. I wanted to ask if it's okay if I spend it on this. You could do that. Or make sure that you've designed the project in a way that you can reinvest it. And one of the things I recommend, particularly with freelancers, is say your project is a theatre show. Don't make the end of the project the last performance of the run. Make the end of the project three months after that and pay for your time to evaluate the project, your time to begin working on the next project, your time to start having conversations with people about where you might go next. How much of that time you spend is, well, I don't know, how much is, how long is a piece of string? 
but that's an easy thing that you have told your funder was part of the project. And if you had a bit of money left over, it might just pay for a few more days of your time at the end to start working on the next thing. Remember, a project for your funder is whatever you define it to be, which can include a bit before your project starts and a bit at the end. You determine when those things are. So think about what would happen if I had money left over? How would I justify keeping it and have a plan built in? Keep all your receipts. Keep all of your evidence. Some funders, Bed Salute and Community Foundation, ask to see them. You know, so just be aware that that can happen. And actually, NLHF and all those people, they could be audited at any time and they could demand to see it. They might not do it routinely, but you could get audited and you need better evidence for what you have to keep everything. Go super detailed. I mean, literally think about, do I need a memory card to put, the, how much is a memory card to buy? Like that level of detail, you know, do I need to... Are we likely to stop for sandwiches halfway through the workshop? Am I going to need to run out and get them? Are you going to have bought them? I, how much would sandwiches cost? Put it all in. Honestly, every single project. It's those little incidental things that tend to push it up that you just don't think. You put your artist fees in your materials and kept it simple. Try and find out what other people are doing. I mean, ask. We're all friendly, aren't we, with each other? Scratch each other's backs. You know, just say, that's interesting. What did you include for that? What kind of level was your last project grant? Just... Try and find out, you know, what you can. Um, it's really important that you just sort of have a bit of an understanding of where you're fitting in. Because if you go too far up or too far down, then that will glare out to a funder. And as I say, it doesn't matter who your funder is. It doesn't matter the fact that the Arts Council say we can fund 100% of the project. Try and get your 10% match. Whether it's in kind or cash, cash is going to be really exciting for a funder. But... Aim for members a 10% match so that you're not wholly reliant on one funder, but you've spread out your costs as much as you can. So we're going to go back through some of these income types, and now we're going to talk about it in the context of fundraising. Grant applications. Oh, I'm looking at time, so apologies if I'm, I'm going to race through this a little bit more to give you some time for questions. This is actually quite simple by... Read the criteria. So if you're going for a grant, first thing you need to work out is who do they grant fund? Would they fund you as an individual or will they only fund charities? And um, one of these ways that you can find out is go and look on the Charity Commission website. If the grant funder is a charity themselves, you just go Charity Commission, search for charity, click on them, download their annual accounts, and you'll get a PDF of their latest annual accounts. Scroll through, see how much did they give in grants, and they probably named who they gave it to and how much they gave. And I can literally see, oh, look, they've never given anyone more than £3,000. So there's absolutely no point in me writing to them and asking for £10,000 is there because they've never given anyone £10,000. You can do that with trusts and foundations. You can't do it with big statutory funders like the Arts Council. You can do it with trusts and foundations that are charities. Always look them up on Charity Commission. Don't apply if there's not a good fit. It's just a waste of your time. If you read the criteria and you go, I'm not sure this is me, don't do it. There's currently 4% success rate. For grants nationally apparently that's dire you know it's tough out there i'm really sorry um if you can try to contact them beforehand unless they say don't you know if you can it's just a quick chat just i, I just want to just check if my project's likely to fit you know the arts council are a little bit like only ask if you really can't do it but if you can if you can sneakily get hold of a relationship manager you just get a bit of a feel just see what they say get some tips if you can um Make sure you tailor the wedding to fit the priorities. So if your project is all about environmental sustainability, but the phrase that they use when they say, we love to fund uh, projects in wildlife, use the phrase projects in wildlife. It just makes it really obvious for them that I'm making this fit you. So you're not going to give the same grant application to every single funder. Might be the same project, but you're going to rephrase it differently depending on who you're targeting to. Don't apply to you already. So this is the other thing is that it sounds awful, but you have to produce the entire project before you apply. And that's painful, I know. But they're going to say, who's a project with? How much are you going to spend? Have you got any partners? Have you spoken to the community about whether they want it? Have you done this? Have you done that? So basically, until you've done all of that work, you can't apply. I'm really sorry. You have to know exactly. I know exactly who I'm working with. I know what I'm going to pay them. I know how long it's going to take. I've, I've designed the whole project. I've built a project plan before you go for the money it's so frustrating because that means that that time is not funded i know but if you can't answer the question you're not ready and they will just pick and pick and pick and pick and pick so don't apply until you've basically 
built the whole project plan, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, and then this is the most important point when you're writing grant applications. Is do you remember you doing like a GCSE exam and you have to do this thing where you say you make a point and then you have to justify it. So that the worst grant applications I ever read go like this. We're a high quality arts organization. And you go, yeah, says you, obviously. Prove it. Because they will read thousands of people every day saying the same thing. So if you're gonna say that you're high quality, prove it. If you're gonna say that you work with marginalized groups, prove it. If you're gonna say that, you know, you're gonna work with a, a venue, which venue? You know, so you need to be able to do it like that. So there's an example. Okay, high quality. We deliver high quality creative projects. There, I've said it. Now I'm going to prove it. In the last five years, 95% of our audiences rated our work as good or excellent. And we received three national press reviews or gave it five star. In fact, I'm going to give you some more evidence. A compelling piece of data we need this. That is a good answer. So you have to do that with every single point you make. Make the point, justify it, provide the evidence. It's going to be like going back to your GCSEs. Here is a place where you can find out about grants. I'm not going to go through it because there are loads of people who can tell you where to find grant funders, but there's a list of possible places. Earned income, all of these things. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Ticket sales, advertising, corporate sponsorship, consultancy, sale of works. This is all money you earn. Difference between corporate sponsorship and donations, reasons to sponsor, reasons to donate. So sponsorship, like I said, it's a trade. The business is getting something in return from giving you that money. It's a sale. It's not a donation. They're going to want something. So examples could be brand profile. You're doing a big event and we could have our name all over it and we're going to get a brand profile. It could be that they're going to access your customers. Yeah, or oh, we sell our product to people like people who are coming to your event. So if we sponsor it, maybe we can get to those people and we can test our products or we can ask some questions and run a survey that's really valuable to a business it could be corporate social responsibility it could be just we've decided we want to be really nice to our local community and and people will think fluffily about our brand if we do that so this is csr objective or it could be hospitality if you've got tickets to something they might say we want tickets for our clients or staff so they're the reasons generally that businesses sponsor Honestly, if you can't offer any of those things, if you can't offer brand profile, if you don't fit with their CSR policy, if you can't offer fancy tickets, they're not going to sponsor you. Don't ask. But you could ask for a donation because they might just say, oh, well, it's 500 quid. I'll just give it to you. And the advantages to them for doing that is they can claim corporate gift aid on that. If they've got too much profit that year, they're going to have a hefty tax bill. They might slip it out the door to a charity or they might just do it because they like you. But it's worth being aware of the differences. Don't ask a business to sponsor you if you can't offer them one of those things. Funny from individuals, why and how would they do it? Different, you know, you usually expect less in return because we're talking about donations, unless you've got VIP benefits that you can give them in terms of membership or friend schemes. But think about why and how someone will, you know, give you money. And then what are you going to do? Be really good at saying thank you. Communicate with them regularly. Tell them what the money has gone on make them feel special and they're going to take some worrying it takes a really long time to persuade people to do it and it's worth looking after them when you do but think about why and how are they going to give you the money is it going to be a crowdfunding mechanism you're going to use is it going to be membership schemes are they going to give out peer pressure because you've done a massive online thing about giving and you've named everybody else who's given like think about how you do it and then look after them so there we are. So I apologize, we've only got five minutes at the end for questions. If you can hand stay on, that's fine. Um, I think, um, you know, that that would be fine if you need to slip away at this point as well. But hopefully for those of you who are watching this back as a recording, I've covered everything that you would find useful. And as I say, we're going to make sure that both the slides and the spreadsheet are available to you. So happy to take any questions if there are any questions. Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. It's actually about Arts Council um, projects. And you mentioned the 4%, which is a bit of a jaw drop. Like, oh, my yeah. God, that's how bad it really is. Um, I just wondered, do we know what the success rate is for projects funding for Arts Council? 
I don't know at the moment. No, I should think it's probably higher than four percent. I think four percent was trust and foundations. Yeah, yeah, and that that was from someone I know who went to one of those um kind of funding fairs recently and and had it. I know there's a funding fair coming up. So one of the things I would say is if you're not registered on the CVS newsletter, get that because they're excellent. Right. Um, and I know CVS is, you know, community voluntary service. So you tend to think it's for charities and people like us. But actually, you can join the newsletter as an individual. And they do free funding fairs where they get funders to come and talk about their funding every year. Um, I think there's one coming up in March. And, you know, I don't think you have to be from an organisation to join. But if you do speak to me and you can be Magica from BCA, do you know what I mean? Like, and then just get the lowdown. But I, sometimes Arts Council do that and they might do actually. Um and then you could ask them. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, I did have, um, yeah, one other question. Could you s share that template of that Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, we'll put that out as well. Yeah, you can change the colours, I was going to say. You could say to people, they <laughs> yeah. can change the colours. <laughs> Some people are a bit like, ah, yeah. I'm glad it, But yes, absolutely, no, yeah. it's... Because um... Um, that would, there's definitely some things in like, oh, I should be doing that, or I could it, I could do it that way. Some really good tips. Thank you very much. No, thanks, Sally. Thanks for joining. Enjoyed. And it wasn't that dry. And you did very well to fit that all into an hour. So well, well done. Know, like, Let's do budgeting and fundraising. Oh, no way. Uh, but yeah, as I say, yeah. you can look back and hopefully digest it a bit more. And I definitely uh, There are so many specialist fundraising webinars and stuff that you can do. You can do a whole one on grants. You can do a whole one on corporate sponsorship. And I think that's something that we will ask people about. So if someone says, ah, actually, I'd like to know a bit more about that particular bit, well, then we could do something bespoke. But this was just a sort of a light yeah. touch starter, really. Well, thank you. It's been very, very good. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll hide now and somebody else can appear. Somebody else can tell <laughs> Yeah. Any any questions from anyone else you can think of? You know, I mean, also my contact details are on the slides. So if you think of something later and you go, oh damn, I meant to ask this, you could email it over. Um, I'm not in again until Monday now, but I am around if you have questions. Had, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had a few thank you comments just to say. I think some of them have probably popped off now, but apparently a very comprehensive talk, very useful. Good. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, but it does sound as though no more questions. Last chance. And then I will end the recording whenever you're ready. I think we'll probably end it there then, George. So thanks, everyone, so much. Thanks for your lovely comments. Thanks, Elaine. That was super uh, helpful, actually. Again, I know I have seen some of it before, but it's kind of gone in a lot better the second time around. So Great. really good. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> good to see. You. Yeah. Oh, great. No, I'm really glad. Yeah. And like, like I said, you you can always if you think of something later and you think actually fine, maybe it's just triggered a few thoughts. And I think it's always just interesting to see what other people do. Yeah, and definitely like Alison said, that um that spreadsheet uh really helps actually. I mean, I've done many budgets, but for some reason I've never laid it out um like that, and that just makes total sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very strict about my committed column. I'm always like, it's one thing having a budget and then what you've done, but it's like, but what what do you think is most likely? You know, and then just keep keep changing it. You know? The thing I I found the most was keeping the the coded bits in each area, so that when you come to do the final report, you're not having to chase everything back. Because I've always done the chasing, I'm like what bit was that in, and oh my god, so that would make the final report so much easier and I can't believe I haven't done it before so and you can I could to be honest I might add just put filters on for you there because the other thing is if you put an account code in then you can you can filter it and go ah, oh yes yeah, so I've coded everything under access costs for the arts council so let's just filter and then oh there that's the amount I need you know it's things like that it's just as you say it can be so time consuming at the end if you're not yeah kind of yeah quiet. and the tip about adding extra time at the end of the project to do all of that final sewing up it is a nice yeah. idea. You don't realise you've got 500 quid. Like, don't, don't, like, suddenly be like, oh, I'm just going out for lunch with everyone because I'm having, like, just buy yourself some days. Like, you know, yeah. put, it on, put it on. Yeah. Brilliant. Definitely. Cool. All right, then. Well, we'll say goodbye then, everyone. And um, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, I'm just going to stop recording now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Bye. you. See you guys. Thanks.